afternoon, everyone. So good to see you here. Welcome to Purdue Engineering Frontier Lecture Series. My name is Luna Lu. I'm Riley Professor of Civil Engineering and also Associate Dean of the Faculty at Purdue Engineering. Today is my great pleasure and truly the greatest honor to invite our speaker, Professor Elon Yablavichi from UC Berkeley. Professor Yablavichi is a person, do not need any introduction. So many people know him for his impactful discovery. Um, if you have not known him, but I'm sure you interacted with the technology he invented. How many of you use cell phone? Pretty much everybody, right? He invented the antenna used in every single cell phone in this planet of the Earth. So let me just highlight a few of his impactful discovery. Professor Yablavichi introduced the idea of strained semiconductor laser that has better performance due to the reduced valence band or whole effective mass with almost every human interaction with the internet that enabled optical telecommunication occurred by the string semiconductor laser invented by Professor Yablavichi. He is also regarded as the father of photonic crystal, photonic band gap concept. If you're in a physicist or electrical engineering, I'm sure you heard of the term photonic crystal that actually invented by Professor Yablavichi as well. And in his photovoltaic research, Professor Yablavich introduced the four n-squared light trapping factor that is worldwide in use for almost, almost every single commercial solar panels. His mantra that a grid solar cell also needs to be a grid LED is indeed the basis of the word record solar cells a single junction reached to 29.1% efficiency, double junction 31.5%, and the quadro junction 38.8 efficiency at only one sun energy. Again, as we talk about his cell phone antenna company called Ethertronics, shaped over two billion antennas used in every single cell phone, right? And we were interacting every single day on a daily basis. Of course, as you can imagine, he is a member of National Academy of Engineer, National Academy of Science, uh, National Academy of Inventor, and also is a foreign member of Royal Society in UK. So again, with a great pleasure and honor, let's invite Professor Elon Yablavichi to the stage. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, it's uh, great to see uh, the uh, large group here. Thank you very much for that uh, terrific introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk about something that uh, it's a little bit uh, technological and uh, maybe a little bit has to do with politics and uh, society. And that is, that is to do uh, with the recognition that has been uh, very, very highly trumpeted that uh, uh, we're in grave danger of having too much uh, CO2. Indeed, the amount of CO2 in the air has gone up quite a lot. And so we're entering uh, sort of a, an unknown uh, region and we need to have a way to solve it. So what this talk is going to be about is how to get CO2 out of the air. We know how to get it into the air, we just burn stuff or fly in a jet, uh, but uh, we have to get it out of the air. And uh, now, some people want to completely eliminate the use of hydrocarbons. I think this is going to be very difficult. Uh, for example, if you want to go to uh, another continent, uh, there's no real substitute for jet fuel. Jet fuel is, has uh, the highest energy density, is very important for staying uh, in, in the air for a long period of time. And uh, I can give you a rule of thumb. If you're going to another continent, the uh, jet will use uh, double your personal weight in fuel. Okay, so, so a very long trip you have to, you have to uh, and then the, the uh, energy to mass ratio 
is very important for the fuel. And they, there's, there's no substitute for hydrocarbons. Uh, we also have a problem with winter or summer energy storage, is that we don't have very good ways of storing energy, except if you store it as, as, as uh, hydrocarbons, then it, it works very well. And uh, then we have another problem, is that there are some countries that, let's say we were uh, in a world where we were uh, greatly reducing the amount of use of hydrocarbon fuels, uh, what do you do about the countries that don't cooperate? Okay, and it's not something that you'd want to start a war over. So you'd have to, you'd have to pull out the, the, their carbon dioxide too. So there, there's always going to be some carbon dioxide going into the air. And unless we extract it, we're going to be stuck. So we have to have a way to extract it. That's what this talk is about. And I'll mention one more, more speculative reason why we want, pull, want to pull carbon dioxide out of the air is that there are some models where the permafrost in the Arctic, as it melts, it would uh, release uh, more CO2 uh, or uh, more methane, which is uh, also a, a very severe uh, uh, problem. Uh, so uh, what, what it says is that uh, five years ago, everybody talked about being carbon neutral. And then it was recognized being carbon neutral is not enough. We actually have to pull carbon dioxide out of the air. We have to have carbon negativity. Okay, so, uh, but some people object that I shouldn't use the negative word. There it is. So what happened uh, also uh, about five, six years ago, uh, notice was taken by the various uh, national academies that we, need to ha we can't just do carbon dioxide. We need to pull carbon dioxide out of the air. So they wrote a bunch of studies on removing carbon dioxide from the air. And this, is, this one is from the uh, National Academy of Sciences of the United States. This one is from the European Scientific Advisory Council, which is sort of the same thing. And they actually used a negative word. Okay, and uh, the, uh, there, were, there was a Physics Today article uh, capturing uh, carbon dioxide uh, from the air. You can see already they're gonna have a problem because they have these pipes here and they're actually forcing the atmosphere through these pipes. And they're gonna pull the carbon dioxide out. You can imagine what it's going to cost to push the entire atmosphere through some pipes. So um, what emerged from this uh, is um, a number of ideas that were extremely expensive. So uh, so-called direct air capture, where you pull the CO2 out of the air using uh, chemical compounds called amines and then you have to heat them up to reuse them. And, and so direct air capture uh, at that time was $600 a ton of CO2. So that's, I will calibrate you in the cost in just a minute. Uh, the, um, the, the $600 a ton can be converted to cents per gallon of gasoline, and then you understand what it's costing. Okay, but the $600 a ton, this has been trumped by a recent uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act payments by the government. The government is actually today paying $1,000 a ton, which is completely ridiculous. Okay, so this, this, is, uh, this was a report uh, from the uh, American Physical Society. It um, was too expensive, obviously. Now, this is from the table of contents of the European report. They looked at all the different ways of pulling carbon dioxide out of the air. You had afforestation, uh, manipulating the forests. Uh, oops. Uh, land management to uh, increase the storage of carbon in soils. And they're particularly they're going to farmers, trying to get the farmers to change their form of agriculture. And uh, you, the, the farmers don't want to change anything. Okay. Uh, uh, bioenergy, uh, essentially a biomass, and then burning it, and then capturing the carbon dioxide from burning the biomass. So it has an acronym BEX, which communicates nothing. But if you're in, the, in that field, they, then you know what it means. Uh, enhanced weathering. So there are certain uh, rocks that uh, actually absorb CO2. And they're not so common, but uh, they can um, uh, uh, be used. Uh, and um, this one is the one that's very expensive, direct air capture and carbon storage. So they capture the carbon dioxide, they pump it underground, and uh, that, uh, that costs money too. Uh, and then uh, there are various ideas to fertilize the ocean. Let me rewrite this, fertilize the ocean. So the idea there is that you uh, fertilize the ocean, uh, the algae grow, 
And then if you're lucky, the algae fall into the very deep crevices into the ocean. Unfortunately, a very, few, a very small percentage actually falls into those crevices and most of it just comes back as CO2, so it doesn't quite work. Uh, now, the one thing that is missing, which is to me the most obvious thing, is the safe burial of agricultural biomass was not even listed, was not even considered by this uh, European uh, committee. And, uh, but apparently they have a more up-to-date uh, uh, version of this. Maybe I should check to see if they uh, acknowledge that the burial of agricultural biomass can be very good. So uh, every uh, spring season, so we're in spring right now, uh, the plants as they grow, they pull carbon dioxide out of the air and uh, the people who monitor the carbon dioxide on the, in Hawaii, on, on the mountains in Hawaii, they actually see the carbon dioxide go down in the spring. So uh, plants, agriculture can actually uh, observably uh, reduce the amount of carbon dioxide uh, at least in months like April and May. So who uh, who am I copying here? So you see, but the ideas are not original. So uh, the idea of using plants to pull carbon dioxide out of the air is due to uh, Freeman Dyson. So Freeman was a, um, I would say, uh, regarded as the most imaginative physicist of the uh, 20th century. Uh, he was very famous, was at the Institute for Advanced Study for his entire career, and um, wrote a paper in 1977, which was quite a while ago, he wrote a paper uh, that said, why don't we just take trees and toss them into the ground, and that's enough to solve the carbon dioxide problem. So he was very good, like most physicists, very good in dealing with orders of magnitude. So the orders of magnitude were correct, but he was not aware that if you throw biomass into the ground, the biomass decomposes. And uh, then if it decomposes, you get back uh, carbon dioxide, but you also get back some methane, which is really bad. and so. Uh, it was a good idea, but incomplete. Uh, but I can't say this idea was original to me, and this is the oldest reference I could find, is Freeman Dyson. And more recently, there is a, uh, the recognition that we actually need to remove carbon from the atmosphere was recognized by the X Prize. So there is now a competition going on, a $100 million prize, and they, were even, they have already given out uh, part of it. And, uh, but the grand prize, we're waiting for the grand prize, but it's for carbon removal. And uh, so it's sort of a recognition uh, that this is an important thing. It's a little too late to uh, enter this competition because there were some preliminary things you had to do. But let me mention one of the reasons why it's so difficult to remove carbon dioxide uh, from the air. Let's compare uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the air versus, let's say, uh, carbon concentration in wood. So in wood, uh, a lot of wood consists of um, uh, carbon, a, a good fraction of it, maybe half. And uh, so you, you're taking a very low concentration, which is um, uh, maybe, uh, well, now it's uh, uh, four, 400 uh, parts per, uh, per million, and you're comparing it to the, the full concentration which is, let's say, in wood, I mean, you have a concentration ratio. So the plants give you a concentration ratio of the order of 10 to the eighth in pulling carbon out of the air and uh, forming uh, wood. Now, uh, when you concentrate something, you reduce its entropy. And you, re you reduce its entropy essentially by KT, uh, K log of that uh, concentration ratio. And the corresponding entropy is 17K, and that converts to an energy of 17KT, and it's close to half a volt. So for every carbon that the plant pulls out of the atmosphere, it costs half a volt. So already you see there's a difficulty. Where does the plant get the energy? It gets the energy from the sun. It, it, it's, it's doing some work uh, that way. So the plants provide the free energy, and, but it's one of the reasons why it's difficult to do. You have to actually supply energy to concentrate uh, carbon. But I said we're going to allow the plants to do it. So here are some plants, and it, it depends upon the region of the world. We are adjacent to Illinois. So the best plant in this region is Miscanthus, which is a uh, perennial. It grows for about 20 years, and it uh, produces a lot of biomass. And much of what I'm saying uh, about the uh, biomass was worked out for me. I didn't have to do any extra effort because about 20 years ago, 
uh, the uh, energy world uh, sort of went crazy about biofuel. So they worked all this stuff out, is where to get the uh, biomass and uh, how much it's going to cost and so forth. And they, in Florida, it's a different plant. It's napier grass. In, in England, which is quite far north, they, even there they had a candidate. And in Mexico, they have a, a different candidate. I'm circling the man. I should be circling the plant, right? Uh, so uh, the, the agriculture is known on how to do this. And they're, they're very efficient. These, uh, these uh, plants are very efficient. Uh, for example, around here, corn is grown. Corn is quite efficient, but uh, these are uh, even more efficient. They're approximately three times more efficient at converting sunlight into uh, cellulose. Uh, so the cellulose is about 40% by weight carbon, and uh, you're, uh, you can extract uh, a, a many tons of carbon uh, from uh, each acre. So this is all worked out, and every country publishes the agricultural statistics, the productivity of the land, the particular crop, uh, and you can look up on the Chicago Board of Trade what the crop is, uh, is uh, costing. So you, you, you know everything you need to know. And it would take uh, quite a large area of land, nonetheless, to remove all of the carbon from the air. But a large, but not ridiculous. It's, it's, it would be a major agricultural product. So I have to introduce, uh, I've already introduced Freeman Dyson. Let me introduce Al Rose. When I was young, he was my mentor and I was working on solar cells, so I got into this through solar cells. And he said, the young whippersnapper, you think you're so smart with those solar cells, do you realize you're gonna have to compete with plants? You're gonna have to compete with agriculture. And he challenges me in the following way. He uh, says, why don't you find out the uh, uh, productivity of corn, he, he was specific to corn, and uh, figure out what it costs on the Chicago Board of Trade, how much the yield is per acre, this is all known things, and figure out how, many, how much energy you get per acre. So he wanted to know the cost of corn, not in bushels, but in dollars per megajoule, you can convert, uh, dollars per megajoule, and compare it to gasoline in dollars per megajoule. Now in case you want to do such a conversion, there are about 160 megajoules in a gallon of gasoline. So you can, you can do the conversion, that part of the conversion yourself. So I went and did the conversion, and he was teasing me. I didn't realize he was teasing me because he had just published this. He had published this in, the, in this article when he asked me this little riddle, and, it, and I, the answer was kind of shocking, is that the cost of gasoline, it was actually during one of these uh, uh, high cost periods of gasoline, the cost of a gasoline in, megajoule, in dollars per megajoule was similar to the cost of corn in dollars per megajoule, which, is, which was kind of amazing. So it, it, I, it gave me the idea, oh my, the solar cells will have to compete with corn. And I think that will happen one day. Not with corn, but with other crops. And so what do you do about uh, Freeman Dyson? He already said, bury the biomass, okay? And so I have here uh, an example of burying the biomass. Now you have to bury the biomass in a specific way, and I'm gonna tell you the punchline right now. How do you prevent biomass from decomposing when you bury it? And the answer is, you dry it. Well, every farmer cannot sell his crop until he dries it. So you dry it, and uh, you, uh, but then you have to keep it dry. How long do you have to keep it dry? Well, uh, you could easily keep it dry for thousands of years, and this would satisfy any environmentalist if you can get the carbon dioxide out of the air for thousands of years. What does it take to do that? When you dry it, you seal it up with four millimeters of polyethylene. So this is, uh, this is the key, uh, four, four millimeters of polyethylene. That stuff does not look like a shopping bag, polyethylene shopping bag. That stuff is very, is like semi-rigid, very, very strong, uh, yet uh, somewhat flexible. And uh, you say, well, that's a crazy idea. Who's ever gonna do that? So that's already being done. So for example, if you had breakfast this morning, uh, you generate, a, let's say, a yogurt cup or some other garbage, and in the most modern landfills, it gets sent to one of these landfills, and it's sealed off with uh, polyethylene. And the, uh, why is this a requirement? The reason is that the authorities don't want the garbage to contaminate the water table. Okay? We are in exactly the opposite situation. We don't want the water table to make our biomass wet. Okay? And, and, and so it's pretty much for the same reason. And one of the things that's extremely well known is how fast water diffuses through polyethylene. And yes, a four millimeter thickness 
will keep water out for thousands of years. So it's, it's somewhat surprising. So we published this in last April. So it's now April again. So it's, we published it a year ago. And um, uh, I, I can tell you some of the things. So I, I, I had a lot of interesting reactions to this paper. But I'll, I'll mention one thing that uh, uh, gets people upset a little bit is that when we bury the biomass, the biomass is essentially cellulose, you see that the, uh, that the uh, carbon is already partially oxidized, okay? Because it's, this is the approximate chemical formula for cellulose. Uh, and so you already have one oxygen in there. Now, suppose, as I mentioned 15, 20 years ago, biofuel was all the rage, and you're starting with the same thing, with cellulose, but it's already half oxidized because it's already got one oxygen on it. So in order to uh, make biofuel, you have to grow two acres of uh, biomass in order to effectively to get one acre of uh, biofuel. So inherently, uh, that w it's, it's going to be a large-scale agricultural enterprise. It would be twice as big if we uh, made biofuel. If, on the other hand, we simply bury the cellulose, the one, you get credit for one acre, and you've put the full amount of carbon into, uh, into sequestration. So, uh, of course, the biofuel people don't like when I say that, but that's, that's the way it is. Okay, now, but if you simply bury it, uh, it gets eaten. Uh, you can see here uh, various insects uh, will eat uh, the uh, biomass. If you seal it off against oxygen, it doesn't matter because there are anaerobic bacteria. And forget about simple burial. Uh, it all turns into uh, carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, and uh, so a simple burial will not work. And what we're saying is, well, this is yet another slide telling you that simple burial will not work. Well, it sort of works a little bit. And in the following sense, uh, that if you take uh, uh, wood, uh, it's very famously, it mostly consists of cellulose, but it also contains uh, lignin. Now, lignin is a compound that is responsible for the grain in wood. So you have wood, you see the beautiful grains, because there is lignin in the wood. Uh, the lignin turns out to be extremely durable stuff. So it was a tremendous headache when they were making biofuel. They couldn't figure out how to process the lignin because it, it, it lasts a very long time. So you will get some credit. If you simply bury the wood, you'll get 30% credit because the lignin will not decompose uh, very rapidly. So uh, it's not like you didn't do anything. You did something, but it's, it's only 30%. The cellulose decomposes right away. So uh, I mentioned the solution is dryness. So now we introduce a scientific concept. How many of you have heard of a concept called water activity? The chemical engineers, sure, do you, you, you're afraid to show your hand, <laughs> okay. So water activity is like uh, the relative humidity. We're all experiencing relative humidity, but you wouldn't uh, assign relative humidity to a solid object. Suppose the solid object was a steak, okay? And then you wouldn't call it, you wouldn't say there's a relative humidity inside the steak. You would say there's a water activity. The concept is exactly the same, uh, but it applies to solid materials. So we don't call it uh, humidity, we call it water activity. Uh, so it applies to food and biomass generally. And you could ask, well, what is the relative humidity in equilibrium with the steak? And uh, that relative humidity in equilibrium with the steak is the water activity. Okay, and so uh, it's a very similar concept. Now, who worries about this? Uh, two government agencies worry about this. The Food and Drug Administration wants to know that the food on the supermarket shelf is safe. And so you have some new product, you want to put it in the supermarket, uh, you have to tell them, okay, wh what's the water activity? Oh, the water activity is uh, below 60%. No problem, wrap it up in cellophane and put it on the supermarket shelf. But it was over, if it was over 60%, it's, it's no good. It's not, gonna, it's not gonna last on the shelf. It would be unsafe, unsafe food. The second government agency that has investigated this is NASA because they're interested in the requirements for life on other planets. And uh, the, uh, the, they 
they've investigated many different forms of life. And the conclusion is, once again, you, in, the, in the most worst cases, you still need at least 60% water activity or metabolism stops. Why does metabolism stop? You have to move chemicals around inside the cell. And to move the chemicals around, you need a, a certain amount of water. And so m metabolism stops at 60% water activity. And so that's the idea, is that if you keep something below 60% water activity, it's going to last a, a uh, uh, as far as we know, it'll last for thousands of years, okay? And so this is a chart of all the different things. Bacteria seems to require about 95%, yeast about 85%, mildews and so on and so forth and weird kinds of mildews that I don't even know what they are. But finally, you get to uh, 0.6 or 60% water activity and metabolism comes to a stop. And of course, the ancient uh, natives knew about this. For example, this is just a photograph of salmon in the Pacific Northwest that are being dried by the natives. They knew very well that if they dry the salmon in the uh, summertime, that it would be preserved so they could eat the salmon uh, in the winter time. So drying is uh, very effective. Now, uh, then you ask, uh, how, how much, uh, how do you compare the weight of water, the percentage weight? So on the vertical axis, I have the fractional weight of water in, in a crop. And the horizontal axis, I have the water activity, which is like relative humidity. And so if you look at different things, different crops, hardwoods and miscanthus, and so forth, around 12% by weight water, you have about 60%. So if you dry below 12% weight by water, you drop below 60% uh, uh, water activity. And it's, it's kind of similar for other crops. So I come back to, I come to a place like uh, Lafayette, and I, 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 I really appreciate the strong agriculture. It's, it's, it's amazingly uh, efficient, and uh, it, w it was started here uh, even before the Civil War. So it's been, it's been this way, and in Chicago, they pay for the, uh, for the crop, let's say for the corn. And it, it is uh, since before the Civil War, if you wanted to sell your corn, you had to dry it below 14% water concentration. And so somehow they knew it would be safe to ship uh, if the farmer dried it enough. And every farmer has equipment for uh, drying his crop because you, you, you can't really ship it you know, or sell it on the Chicago Board of Trade, which doesn't want to buy water anyway. It wants to pay you only for the corn part. So for, you had to keep it dry. And if you kept it dry, it, you could ship it long distances. And so uh, this uh, is a, a slide I showed you before, but we have now a little bit of information is that if you dry it l enough, it will last for uh, 10,000 years, uh, uh, largely because the polyethylene keeps out the water. Now, how efficient is it? Uh, the uh, polyethylene, if you have liquid water on one side and you want to find out how much water gets through, uh, then in every year, two microns equivalent thickness of water gets through every year. But this uh, dry biomass is typically about 100 feet. You'd have sort of a landfill that's 100 feet thick. And uh, so with uh, uh, two microns of water getting through, it will last for 10,000 years. The scale is given here. It's roughly, uh, uh, that's a 30 meter marker. It would be uh, maybe a couple of hundred yards by a couple of hundred yards uh, uh, in size. And, and the thickness would be about uh, 20 meters uh, or 30 meters rather. Okay, and so uh, that's how it will last. Okay, so I have here uh, a bunch of numbers, which I'm not going to go through these numbers, except to say that uh, every year the world I injects uh, 20 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide in the air, and you have to pull it out, or we would have to pull it out. So it uh, represents a, a big effort. But uh, in the course of the biofuel research, they investigated how much agriculture you would need. And uh, so this is an official Department of Energy report. And uh, I can go a step further. Is another report from the Department of Energy and, and all of these funny units. And I can summarize the whole thing. Worldwide, this would be a pretty big crop. It would be equivalent to 
all the corn and all the wheat. So it's, it's, uh, it would be a very large crop to pull all of the carbon dioxide out of the air, but it's, it's quite doable. And so, uh, but people worry about this, so uh, let me show you what's going on. Uh, this horizontal axis represents all the land on the Earth, and some of it is useless, like uh, at the North Pole. It, in the South Pole, it's covered in ice, so that's kind of useless. So let's talk about the stuff that is usable. Uh, so all this is usable, and I, it, it's uh, for agriculture, for forestry, uh, some of it is just shrubs. And even a little bit is representing uh, things like cities and lakes and things of that sort. Now, of the agricultural part, this represents the row crops, the corn and other things. This represents pasture land. How's that? I'm showing up. Okay, good. And the amount that you would need for agro sequestration would be this blue bar. So I think uh, it's safe to say that, uh, yes, it would be a huge amount of agriculture, but it's... Uh, uh, within the realm of uh, availability, that land is actually available for this. Uh, so then, so the availability is there. What about the cost? Uh, so you can figure out the cost in various ways. Uh, I, my preferred way is I go to the Chicago Board of Trade. I figure out what they're paying for the crop and what is the yield of the crop. I, I, I can figure out how much uh, money the farmers are getting per acre, and um, uh, th then I can. Uh, well, I'll make the claim that growing a non-food crop is, if anything, easier than growing a food crop because the food crops you're competing with insects and the non-food crop you're not necessarily competing with insects, so it's a little bit easier to, to grow. And, but I'll take th those costs and uh, we've done it both ways. We did a bottoms-up analysis of what the farmers are, uh, all their costs, including the renting of the land, which is the biggest part of the cost. And, uh, and I, I flipped it around and figured out what the farmers were being paid to the Chicago Board of Trade. And we got similar results. So approximately $30 a ton of CO2 equivalent uh, for the agricultural part. Miscanthus is slightly better than some of the others. And then you have to build the environmental chamber. How do we know the cost of the environmental chamber? Because there are contractors who build exactly these types of landfills today. And you can go to those contractors and say, how much does it cost? to build a landfill of this size. And so it came out to be uh, also si similarly about $30 a ton. And the other crops are a little bit worse. Switchgrass, not quite as good. Loblolly pine trees, also not quite as good. But loblolly pine trees are very, uh, uh, very effectively grown in the southeast United States. So you do, you do find that uh, uh, there is actually a lot of biofuel uh, from the southeast. Okay. So now I promised you a unit's conversion. Well, first of all, what does it come out to? It was $30 plus $30. It was $60 a ton. And I mentioned the government is now paying $1,000 a ton for CO2. And we're at $60 a ton. Okay, so what does that add to the cost of gasoline? So this is high school science uh, chemistry uh, uh, exam. Okay, if you have $60 a ton of CO2, and now you have to figure out well, how much that is in gasoline, but you can, there's a certain amount of carbon in the gasoline. You figure the whole thing out, and it comes out to be 53 cents a gallon of gasoline. So what this says is that we could solve the CO2 crisis if people were willing to pay 53 cents a gallon extra for the gasoline. Now in California, if I was giving this talk in California, people would laugh. The price of gasoline goes up and down by uh, couple of, well, a dollar at least, a dollar in either direction uh, all the time. The regulations change. The ga because of the regulations, gasoline is, more, is a lot more expensive there than it is here. And uh, so there's the cost. And the amount of CO2 we have to pull out is 2 billion tons a year. And uh, then we can figure out what is this going to cost the world economy. So uh, you, you convert the $60 a ton, you can convert that, and it ends up being uh, $1.2 trillion a year, which sounds terrible, okay, but the world economy is $100 trillion a year. And so it would set back the world economy by 1.2%. Uh, okay, I'm, and I'm not saying this is good, but it's not bad, and it's not a disaster. And, uh, uh, I really started this project because one of my uh, good friends, 
uh, was very worried about his grandchildren and says, well, are you, are you willing to pay a little extra? You know, like maybe set back the economy by 1.2%. Well, the world economy improves by roughly 2% a year due to productivity. So one year of the productivity might be a little less. And then, and then you'd carry on from that. So it, I, I, it's quite reasonable. But then, oh yeah, I got to tell you what happened. So then we send the paper off to be published. And uh, the referee comes back, one of the referees comes back and says, uh, you need to find an example in nature where something was kept dry for uh, thousands of years and it did not decompose. Okay, so we actually knew an example, but we didn't include it in the paper, but we uh, changed the paper. So the example comes from Israel, uh, a very famous mesa uh, adjacent to the Dead Sea. Well, it used to be adjacent to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea has gone down a little bit back here. Um, it was famous as the last holdout against the Romans. However, before the Romans came, there was a king, uh, king Herod, who appears in the Bible. And king, king Herod, is, uh, well, like all kings, he's afraid of being overthrown. So he built a castle, and th this is the castle that he built. Okay, and it's a very remote location, very hostile environment, and was abandoned for 2,000 years. And then in 1965, a, an archaeologist went and excavated uh, King Herod's uh, palace or castle, and he found a lot of things, and he wrote a lot of papers that archaeologists read. Okay, but one of the things he found was some seeds for the date palm tree. And these seeds are sort of the size of pecans. And so the story sort of uh, I, is told in pictures. Here is a, a likeness of King Herod, some carving from 2,000 years ago. This is the archaeologist, mid-1960s. He digs it up. He finds lots of treasures. One of the treasures are the seeds, but he doesn't know what to do with them. Okay? And then this woman, who is a medical doctor at a hospital in Jerusalem, but she was sort of a creative person. She heard about this, and she sweet talks the archaeologists into releasing some seeds to her. And then she sweet talks some carbon dating people into carbon dating the seeds. And the seeds are indeed 2,000 years old. Okay? And then she persuades uh, this woman, who is a horticulturalist, I have these seeds, can you check to see if they germinate? And they indeed germinated and started with a little tiny plant and grew to a bigger plant and had to change pots and then ends up as a tree 18 years later, this 18-year-old tree. Uh, it is uh, somewhat protected by this uh, wrought iron fence because it is a historical and scientific uh, relic. It was a tree that's 18 years old but germinated from a seed that was kept in relatively dry conditions for uh, 2,000 years, and the DNA was preserved, and uh, if for certain, the, if the DNA is preserved, the cellulose is preserved. So it's uh, kind of famous, and we put this as figure five of our paper, and the referee accepted it. And uh, so uh, that part is known. I have to share with you a few more facts about agriculture uh, that are worth uh, noting. And that is that there is a Moore's Law for agriculture. So here is a graph showing that in, um, uh, in uh, relatively, I think this, is, uh, this applies to least developed countries, nonetheless the productivity of agriculture doubled over a 50-year period. So this is the Moore's Law for agriculture. And it doesn't just apply to underdeveloped countries. It applies to other countries. For example, I found data uh, for the productivity uh, of wheat in England, and dating back to the 1700s, but I saw the graph at 1800, which is around the time that Malthus told us that the Industrial Revolution was useless because we wouldn't have enough uh, food to feed everybody. And uh, during the 1800s, the productivity of the land doubled, and this is true for anything that human beings do. If we're always getting better at it. The more we do it, and it's called the learning curve, and it's actually taught in business school. So then, from uh, 1900, the Haber process came along to pull nitrogen out of the air. So we had artificial fertilizer, and uh, the agricultural productivity doubled again uh, until 1950. From 1950 to 2000, it doubles again. So the Moore's Law for Agriculture 
is uh, doubling. It's not as fast as a regular Moore's law for transistors, but it doubles every 50 years. It really adds up. And uh, the uh, growing wheat, even in Great Britain, it's eight times more yield per acre uh, than was the case when Malthus warned us there wouldn't be enough food. Of course, this is terrific for people who eat food. It's not so good for the farmers because the overproduction causes the prices to go down. But uh, the area around Lafayette, this is a most, about, uh, among the most productive farmland in the world, uh, largely because the glaciers pushed all this dirt down below the Great Lakes and the topsoil in places like Lafayette, I don't know your exact topsoil here, but in central Illinois, which is uh, similar, uh, the topsoil is 18 feet thick and, and uh, it's extremely productive for that reason. But uh, whatever productivity it had, it, it went up by factor eight. Okay, and this is all the agricultural land that has gone out of production because we have too much agricultural land. Uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, I know this is true back east. Uh, the, there, uh, are, there are farms in New England that are just woodlots now. Okay, so this is the amount of agricultural land. This is the uh, amount of land being used for agriculture. It's, a lot of it has fallen out of production because of this uh, uh, increase in productivity. But uh, the conclusions I arrived at do not rely upon future increases in productivity. I put in the numbers for today. So uh, what I've, have I described is it's a scalable industry. Agriculture is uh, one of mankind's largest industries, also, also the oldest industry. Uh, that the cost is reasonable, equivalent to 53 cents a gallon of gasoline, and 1% of the world GMP, but spread over 100 years. Um, the stability, I think we are the only scheme, this is the only scheme that has experimental data going back 2,000 years. There are a lot of ideas out there, but yeah, come back in a few hundred years, let's see how it works. Okay, and it's we need predictability. We don't need to do experiments and wait. We can predict and validate the approach right away. And as far as implementation, implementation is concerned, it can be implemented at the next growing season, which is this month, actually. Okay, uh, so uh, I have a, uh, to offer apologies. I'm a high-tech guy offering a low-tech solution, okay? Uh, but I would say the reason this is correct is that uh, the world cannot take a chance on some weird ideas, and this is one of the simplest, dumbest things. Uh, and uh, we can't try to predict what things, what will happen hundreds of years from now. So uh, this has been proven for 2,000 years. Now, with regard to the land, especially in Europe, they're very concerned about converting agricultural land for uh, biofuel uses. And it's actually illegal in Europe to do this. However, in the United States, uh, it, we've already made that decision. So for example, 40% of US corn is already going into ethanol into biofuel. And can you imagine a state the size of Iowa, which is a very large state, and take 40% of that state, and that's already being used for biofuel. And of course, the ethanol is extremely inefficient. They could be growing miscanthus, and, uh, and, uh, pr and probably should be. So I have here a bunch of uh, conclusions. Uh, the, uh, one, of, one of the conclusions is that by its nature, uh, such a technology can overshoot in the sense it can pull out carbon dioxide that has been put there decades ago. So uh, the, uh, uh, it can remove not only this year's emissions, but also historical carbon emissions. That, that's what it means to be carbon negative. But we have to beware of complacency and the moral hazard. We have to continue research in new forms of energy. And uh, we still need to do everything else. We still need conservation, efficiency improvements, alternative energy, decarbonization, and other forms of sequestration. There are many forms of sequestration, and we need an all of the above approach. So uh, it turns out that in, in this field, the, re the recent recognition is agriculture can actually do it. And uh, there are some companies that have uh, gone along uh, this way. So one of the companies is from uh, Silicon Valley called Charm, and they want to take agricultural products uh, process the carbohydrate into this thing which kind of looks like tar, 
Does that look awful? Process it as tar and pump it back into the ground. Okay? And uh, they have received huge amounts of venture capital and a contract to, uh, for $53 million to take carbon dioxide out of the air. But I can tell you this is nowhere, it's the right idea, but the efficiency is not there. When you have to uh, move the biomass some distance to an industrial plant, uh, it, and then you have to move somewhere else. Uh, the cost is, the transportation cost is very important. When we bury the biomass in our scheme, it's right underneath the agricultural area. And uh, so, and also to, because uh, I know this question will come up, is that one acre of, uh, of uh, uh, let's say, let's call it an, an underground environmental chamber, one acre can uh, accept uh, the biomass from 10,000 acres of agriculture. Is that, so there's another company here. So this one is founded, uh, at least financially backed by Bill Gates. It's called Graphite. And um, uh, the, the thing about Graphite is if you look at their webpage and their scheme, it uh, is very similar to uh, preprint that we had before we wrote our final manuscript. And it has a lot of inefficiencies that they did not take out. So for example, in that preprint, we talked about these bricks, and these bricks are not the most efficient way of doing it. And um, uh, a lot of other strange things that we put into our preprint ended up in their business plan. So I'm not going to comment on uh, who's copying whom, uh, but uh, uh, the, print, the preprint was supposed to be confidential this for the referees, but somehow I think they got hold of it. In any case, they're projecting also extremely low cost, just like we are, but not quite as low because they don't have all of the improvements that we eventually put in. Uh, so $100 a ton, why is the government paying $1,000 a ton? That's crazy. Okay, and, uh, but they've been successful. They're, they're, they're very, very well backed, a lot of publicity. They have a contract with American Airlines. So you buy a ticket on American Airlines, and, it, and after you buy the ticket, is, do you want to buy travel insurance? Is it press no? The next page is, would you like to offset your carbon? Okay, and the money goes to graphite. Uh, so uh, the, it, it's, a, it's a going thing right now, and it's very well financed, so it's going to happen. And uh, of course, being a company, they don't, uh, they don't um, uh, do acknowledgments or citations. <laughs> so we, we don't get mentioned. Okay, so uh, let me summarize. The idea is that being carbon neutral is not enough. It uh, leaves humanity exposed to danger. That's why people are worried about uh, their grandchildren. And, but now carbon dioxide removal is a thing, and it's a, a developing thing. And uh, agro sequestration can do this. And uh, so let me finish with that. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Perfect timing, perfect timing. Well, thank you so much. Uh, well, hopefully politicians would be very receptive to the ideas, like venture capitalists and, uh, um, and the companies. Yeah, questions? Uh, rather a comment, let's, I would like to put your number of 1.2% into history rather than economics perspective. A uh, few years back, uh, if you remember, there was a major push by President Trump of forcing European economies to invest the uh, agreed upon amount of 2% into their military expenditure, they were about 1.5, they did not succeed. 0.5% was impossible. And uh, when you talk about wealthy countries, it's a lot easier for them to do than to increase, than to put in comparable amount of uh, resources for not so wealthy country. The only way it ha could happen, and it did happen as a result of the major war was hundreds of thousands of casualties. Mm -hmm. That's how it was in the entire human history. So there are two possibilities for this to happen if the humanity doesn't change. Option one, it is the result of a major war. Option two, it's 1.2% of profit, not expense. Right. Or option three, humanity doesn't somehow changes yeah. momentarily. Uh, historically, there was not a situation, uh, I am not aware of a single violation of that rule. 1.2% okay. is impossibility according to the previous history. Well, uh, let me uh, make a comment on that. Uh, it's very difficult to get every country to agree because it does cost money. Uh, however, if you get three countries to agree, uh, uh, then uh, it'll, they'll be, they're big enough countries. So the three countries are the United States, China, and Brazil. Uh, they have enough agricultural potential 
they, they could do this. And uh, of course, other countries, uh, they say they'll want some of the money too, so they'll probably uh, uh, do some of this as well. And uh, so I'm a little bit more optimistic about carbon sequestration, but with you, I'm less optimistic about uh, uh, world peace. <laughs> I like this idea of drying plants and store on. Can you hear me? Yes. Drying plants and store them on the ground with a polyethylene shell so they won't go bad. Yeah. Uh, but how about turning them into alcohol, which can also last a long time without going bad? Did you say alcohol? Yeah. Uh, alcohol. So we already have that. Uh, that's the uh, gasohol. Uh, it's extremely inefficient. Uh, uh, it produces a lot of emissions. Uh, I just about everybody agrees that uh, gas a hole is, is not a good idea. But I don't quite see how you would store such large amounts, where it's much easier to see how you would just store the biomass. You don't have to process it. Yeah. Yeah, but and drink it. <laughs> okay, the next one, please. Yeah. Uh, I did. Uh, try to understand the concept uh, from conservation of mass energy, elemental mass energy, mm -hmm. and uh, transport processes, uh, and so forth. But if you wear uh, your professorial hat and uh, tell us about uh, uh, how many of those, con or just using one control volume, what physical and chemical processes are important, and if the balances have been worked out in terms yeah. of diffusion resistance? So this, this paper so here, yeah, it's a good question. This paper here uh, is within the length limitation of papers in, the, in that journal. But then we added 86 pages of supplementary information to deal with uh, some of those questions. The easiest one to understand uh, is we introduced a term, uh, carbon efficiency. So let's say you sequester 100 tons of carbon but you had to run the agricultural tractors. You had to uh, run the transportation. You had to uh, uh, produce the fertilizer, and so on and so forth. Uh, so how many tons of carbon dioxide did you emit in the course of all of those other things? And uh, so uh, because these plants are very efficient uh, at uh, pulling carbon dioxide out of the air, uh, the carbon efficiency is 95% for these plants, approximately 95%. And that takes into account uh, all of those factors that I mentioned that people are very worried about. Uh, uh, the, even uh, when you put uh, nitrogen compounds into the soil, uh, they eventually decompose and they give you nitrous oxide. We, have to take that, we took that into account as well. So taking all of those factors into account, you sequester 100 tons, uh, uh, but net-net you're sequestering 95 tons. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. My question is, um, what happens after 2,000 years to the biomass that is sequestered? And in the process, are we trying to avoid the crisis now and delaying it for a later stage? Uh, that's, that's a, a very good question. Uh, I think it comes up in, in the following context. At some point, let's say, uh, who knows what the future holds, maybe some vandal will come along and uh, they would have to dig through 20 meters of soil and uh, make a hole in the polyethylene. Okay. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, the environmental chambers are modular, so they would wreck one environmental chamber. And uh, maybe that would happen before 10,000 years, so let's deal with that problem. So what would happen then is that uh, you would, uh, uh, you know, it would not be an immediate disaster because it takes decades for the biomass to decompose. So you have decades to solve the problem. Uh, and uh, the solution to the problem is you excavate it, uh, dry the biomass, now that it's been made wet, dry it, and then uh, uh, store it again, just put it back into uh, one of these underground environmental chambers. But what about after 10,000 years? Uh, so the reason we, that sort of is an important number, it is thought that um, uh, the uh, carbon dioxide uh, drops out of the atmosphere very slowly. Part of, part of it goes very quickly, but part of it goes slowly. And the part that goes slowly 
could take 900 years. And so uh, for that reason, uh, we thought uh, uh, several thousand years was, uh, was a, a good indication. Uh, now, uh, will, uh, uh, what will the technology, energy technology look like 10,000 years from now? I don't even know what it's going to look like 50 years from now. But it, there will be improvements. There have always been improvements. Uh, the um, solar is becoming very big. So I got into this through my work in uh, solar cells. Uh, so uh, I think with 10,000 years, we kick the can down the road far enough uh, that we, uh, we can uh, be pretty respectable. The X Prize competition requires only 100 years. And I think that's really uh, insufficient. Uh, so that's more of a judgment call, is uh, how long do you want to wait and how, how much security for how many centuries do you want? Before we all move to Mars or something. The yeah. last one. Okay, so this is kind of a simple question, but I was wondering if the land above the buried, mi uh, buried biomass is able to be utilized in any way? Yes, that's the point. Uh, the, the calculations we've done include the cost of burying the uh, environmental chamber under 20 meters of soil. Now, why 20 meters? It's expected that tree roots will not go down uh, 20 meters, and so the tree roots will not cause problems. Uh, the animals will not go down 20 meters, etc. But in case we need to go a little further, that would add slightly to the costs. But absolutely, the land on top becomes agricultural land. So if you imagine that if humanity does this long enough, eventually the land around, uh, around uh, West Lafayette might go up by 30 meters. Okay, and and uh, maybe Lafayette would be higher by 30 meters. Uh, so uh, the, uh, uh, that is uh, a, a very important question, and people are very concerned about that. You, get, you retain your farmland. Well, um, with that, I guess uh, let's thank our fantastic speaker one more time today. Thank you so much.